for those who cannot be here. You know, it's, let me see if I can just read all this stuff. What do you want me speaking? How about just, do you mind standing? I can let you use a microphone. Probably in the back. Probably a little, a little something. Do you mind? Okay, and I've got handouts. Oh, that's what you're for. I knew it. Everybody's still in the front row, man. We have like 20 handouts, so if we need to share, well, two, four, six, eight, ten. Yeah, we should be fine. Um, so again, I want to introduce. Uh, yeah, a very really good friend of mine, uh, the Reverend Dr. Brian Hooper. Uh, State of Tennessee, licensed clinical pastoral therapist. You saw all this information in the email. But, um, you know, integrating the wisdom of spirituality and the insights of clinical and counseling uh, psychology to ameliorate, ameliorate. ameliorate suffering and maximize wholeness and well being. Uh, so, I'm just going to leave it up to you. Okay, and I need a copy for myself for what I'm doing. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Sure. sure. Great. So okay. I'm just going to leave it up to you. All right. That sounds good. <clears throat> good. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, thank you for your hospitality. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for a grace-centered uh, homily this morning. I appreciate that. Uh, particularly when we live in a, a broken and hurting world to hear the uh, message of God's grace for us. And uh, good, now we've got the mic turned up a little bit. Um, it's very important. And uh, the, the work that I do in the area of integrating um, spirituality and clinical counseling psychology really is focused on helping people be the most whole people that they can possibly be. Um, so what is spirituality? Let's just talk about that for a moment. What is spirituality? yourself? Something outside oneself? Interesting. We'll come, we'll come back to that in a second. Yeah. Any other ideas about what is spirituality? For me, I think it has to do with that contact within ourselves to our higher power, whatever. Mm -hmm. to choose to call that higher power. Uh, God. Uh, I think it's an indwelling. And it connects us. Our spirituality connects us to other people. Okay, connection, something within us, something with outside of us as well. No? Okay. Well, I need to tell you something. Um, so, you know, you hear people say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. You've heard that? <laughs> and uh, years ago, having gone through 40 years of seminary and being out in parish ministry, I would hear people say that, and I would say, quietly to myself, not so that they could hear it, because my mother raised a polite boy. Uh, uh, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And I would say to myself, that's just because you're too lazy to do the hard work. <laughs> now, isn't that a condescending attitude? <laughs> okay. But the thing is, I know something about myself. And would I ever have a tendency to push away? It usually has a gift in it for me. So at least I, I recognized that. And I said, no, my emotion, strong emotional reaction to that is something that I need to look into. That, my friends, is what we call shadow work. When we look at those things that we really don't want to face, because frankly, that's where the growth is for us in our lives. <clears throat> so I, <clears throat> I asked myself, what, is there something that is common to all people of goodwill, religious or not, that we could call spirituality. And so I did some real research in that area and uh, ended up reading a book by a, a fellow uh, a pastoral psychotherapist um, uh, who had done work uh, digesting the work of a philosopher from Canada, Lonegren, a Jesuit philosopher. And uh, the, the fellow I read was named Hilmeniak. And so I told him I was going to do the chicken soup for the soul version of, of his work. 
Uh, and he said, gee, I thought I'd done that. And I said, no, you need a master's degree in philosophy or psychology or theology. I actually understand what you've written. So here it is. Spirituality is about connection. It's about our most uh, connection with our most authentic selves to God and also to each other. But it has, it has four parts to it. The first part is to be awake to what's going on inside of you, between you and anyone else, and around you in the world, just to be awake. Sleepers awake, we sing it at least once a year, don't we? Be awake to what's going on in you, between you and others, and around you in the world. Number two, be thoughtful, that is full of thought and wonder and curiosity. That is, think about those things you're awake to. Get curious about them, right? Awake, thoughtful, um, rational. Is my thinking about what is I'm awake to logical? Does it fall within the canons of logic and reason? Or am I just thinking in an emotional kind of way? And if I do that, then I'm going to stay estranged probably from myself and from others, right? Because when we think emotionally, we're not thinking rationally and logically. But if I'm going to connect to other people who don't necessarily believe what I believe, I need to be able to stand back and not just have an emotional response to that. I need that to, to understand it from their perspective. Understanding, that's what's behind listening. When we listen to each other, we don't need to just offer each other bromides, um, advice, uh, counsel. We need to really hear. I had a young man who came into my office recently, and a, a trauma throughout his life. First of all, he was born with a huge birth scar on the side of his face. Right? He had multiple surgeries for that. People dying around him. Uh, betrayed by people he went into business with. I mean, it was one thing after another after uh, physical trauma came into his life, and just when he thought he was going to be doing great, another physical trauma came into his life out of nowhere. And uh, at the end of the session, I said, what have you found helpful? And he said, somebody who doesn't look to me and say, pardon my language, but gee, shit follows you everywhere but somebody who could actually listen and care. So part of being awake to what's going on with other people is really listening at a deep level and being with them. People need to know they're not alone. How many times have you experienced perhaps somebody who is sensitive saying to you at the time of a loss, I don't know what to say except this, I'm with you. I am with you. You ever heard that? That means more than, oh, everything's going to be okay. Just trust Jesus. Well, yes, you should trust Jesus, but, but what I need to be is Jesus to these other people, and you need to be Jesus to me when I'm walking through something. Does that make sense so far? Four pillars of spirituality. Be awake to what's going on in you, between you and others, and around you in the world. Be thoughtful, think about it, okay? Be curious about it, don't immediately jump to conclusions. Be reasonable, make sure you're thinking rationally and not in a prejudiced way. And then be response-able. What does that mean? Respond in a way that enables wholeness and well-being, where? In me, between me and you, and around me in the world. You see how that all comes full circle? Now. This is the little tricky part, it's kind of fun. That's the same process that scientists use to come to discoveries and create new ways to serve humanity. They get curious, huh, wonder about that. They think about it. Then they ask if their thinking is rational, and they ask their peers, here, read this article that I have written, look over my experiment, tell me, does this make sense to you? Did I do it right? And then hopefully, unless they're mad scientists, they're using it for the good of the world. You know, I have mixed thoughts about pharmaceuticals, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But uh, hopefully, that's the way it works. So there is a there is a pattern that brings science and faith together. You wait, thoughtful, reasonable, responsible. 
All right, so I'm going to now, that was just a bonus. This now we're going to get into it. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, so um, I was asked to talk about trauma. Um, grief, of course, often accompanies trauma, but I really want to focus on um, what is trauma, how do we recognize trauma, how do we respond to trauma, okay? So if you want to just follow along with me, and I'll add in some stories and um, some examples as we go along. And if you have questions, it's okay to just raise your hand in the middle of things and I'll try to clarify, okay? So the definition, trauma is an experience, physical or psychological, that a person perceives as harmful or life-threatening, overwhelming one's ability to respond or manage the assault, often resulting in shock, denial, and changes in body, brain, consciousness, and behavior. Said in a shorter way, trauma is anything that happens that overwhelms our ability to be able to handle it quickly and move on. Okay, sources of trauma. A medical diagnosis and or treatment. Some medical treatments are absolutely traumatic. So they may save the life of the person, but there has to be accompaniment that goes with that in order to help them deal with that itself. Chemotherapy, some surgeries. I've, 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 I've had people in my practice that I've seen who have had tremendous trauma from medical experiences. Uh, sexual assault. Um, approximately one in four women are sexually assaulted before the age of 18, and one in six men, boys, are assaulted before the age of 18, okay? It's extremely high. Family violence, refugee status, imagine being a stranger in a strange land. and not knowing if you're safe, if you're going to be deported, if you're going to be taken advantage of. Terrorism. I remember my mentor and friend, also a Lutheran pastor, calling me up the morning of 9-11. He said, turn on your TV set, the world has changed. And from that point on, everything changed for us, right? I mean airport security changed and we had, and it almost felt like there were people that worked to, to drum up the anxiety in us. What status are we at now? Where is an orange level now? Oh, we're down to green. Oh, we're up to red. What were we supposed to do with that information, right? And, you know, my father taught me as a little boy before that seemed like the world came undone. Son, always be aware of your environment. Keep your eyes open. Know where you are. Know who's around you. Don't think that cars in the parking lot see you. They don't. Pretend that they don't. You watch out for that. Was the era in which I was raised. Okay, uh, and and that seemed to be good enough until 9/11. <laughs> I know myself. After that time, I don't sit with my back to the door of a restaurant. I'm not anxious. It's just one of those things I don't do anymore. I want to control as much of my environment as I can because that's how I help myself be safe. That's how we humans do it. Make sense? Sit in the back of a theater. Sit in the back of a theater or sit near an aisle where you can get out, right? Before the movie starts, you look around to see what you can see. Yeah. Do you sit in the back of the theater? Pretty much. Right. Understandable. And I look for trench coats. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And I've seen them. Yeah, yeah, Pastor said, and I look for trench coats, and I've seen them, because what's hiding underneath that? Right? All right. Um, criminal victimization, intimate partner assault and intimidation. There was a prayer about that in the prayers of the people today. Natural disaster, which you folks in this side of Nashville have endured a lot of, right? Childhood abuse and neglect. 
Um, there's an inventory called the ACE inventory. The, um, it's the uh, childhood, um, pardon me? Thank you. Have I got a social worker back here? No. <laughs> Adverse child experiences, yeah. Inventory. Well, I, I don't work for the Maxwell Medical Clinic, but I have an office in the Maxwell Medical Clinic. And, uh, and we, we take care of a lot of the same people. And um, in that clinic, they use that as part of their intake form because it's looking for adverse events that have happened to people in childhood because they continue to affect them throughout life. Why? Because it affects the neurocircuitry in the brain and people get um, conditioned to look at their world in a certain way. I'll give you an example. One man that I'm seeing in my practice right now, I see he, I see his wife, and I've seen them and continue to see them together. Both have made tremendous progress in the last couple of years, but um, his mother was was psychologically very ill when he was a child. She was a drug abuser. Parents divorced. Father met another woman. He said, "I don't want those kids around." So sister was sent back to mentally ill mother, and son was put into foster care. Here, take my son. And that's when he started doing things like lining up his shoes perfectly in a row. The idea being, if I can do this all perfectly somehow, that will lead to my father coming back. Right? So he lives with obsessive compulsive disorder. It's an anxiety disorder. And people develop this as a way to try to manage their anxiety. We want to do that. We want to control as much as we can. Make sense? So adverse child events are extremely important. Accidents, of course, are another source of trauma. What are the symptoms of trauma? Turn the page over. OK, well, the, the first things that we think of are these, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. When confronted with a danger, I may run if I can. That's what most of us will do. Uh, if I can't run, I may fight back to try to save myself and others. If that seems like not a great idea because I'm going to be overwhelmed, I might freeze. You've seen animals that play dead. Why do they do that? So that the predator animal will simply walk away, game over, we're done. Don't want something that's already dead. Um, and sometimes we fawn. What does that mean, the fawn? Um, well, it means to try to ingratiate yourself with the one who is perpetrating some sort of danger or harm. Right? And so if you grow up in a family where you're constantly having to keep dad happy, in order to not be beaten, that's how you approach the challenges of life. Always in a subservient, surrendering kind of way. So, um, yeah, those are four things we can recognize. I, um, I have one, the, the gentleman I mentioned to you before, um, married a woman who has a lot of mm, not physical trauma in her background but was raised by a father who was a good provider but always angry and always in danger of bursting out and you never knew when he was going to burst out and she said I learned early on how to blend into the paint on the wall and so she she would just step back and kind of blend in or what they have both come to call jazz hands I'll just entertain you, and so you won't be distracted by the thing that's distracting you, and you'll be over here, and you'll be happy, right? Putting on a show. Well, if you're putting on a show, then you're not being, what? Authentic with yourself, with others, with the world around you. It messes up your spirituality. This, do you see the picture coming together a little bit? 
Yes? All right. Um, okay. So, yeah. Um, next would be intrusive thoughts, flashbacks, and nightmares. That's what we usually think of with post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Men and women who have served in war zones, or they have served in police department, or they've been in some, and it doesn't even have to be that. It could be somebody who who had a brutal parent, or was one young man I've seen recently was uh, accosted at gunpoint by three different uh, adult males uh, in um, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, that was a traumatic event for him, of course, because what is trauma is something that you cannot, uh, don't have the wherewithal to respond to immediately and get beyond. Uh, and so he was having flashbacks. So we, in, we used some talk therapy, but we also used um, neuro-linguistic programming uh, technique to help him get beyond that. Um, the inability to think clearly, so impaired executive to function, function comes when people have trauma. Uh, what does that mean? Well, the front part of your brain is the part that assesses and makes rational decisions on what to do with challenges. Right? And when the brain is overwhelmed by trauma, all you really want to do is preserve your life. Flee, fight, freeze, spawn, and this part, what we call the thinking part, just goes offline. And so people feel frozen like they don't know what to do. They're overwhelmed. And I want to say this. It's normal to feel abnormal in an abnormal situation. So when the tornado comes, and something gets destroyed, and you're looking around and you're feeling numb, and it feels like you can't rub two brain cells together, know that you're normal. That's normal. It takes a while to recover from that, but it's okay. What do you think happens when um, <clears throat> a couple get in an argument and they're in a fight or flight kind of pattern, right? They're both feeling challenged. That's what they want to do, fight or flee. How long do you think this part works up here, the thinking part? It goes offline. So people who have a lot of trauma then can also have trouble re-engaging in healthy communication and relationships with people because they're in their emotional part of their brain and not in the rational part. Okay. Um, what else? Um, other symptoms. Avoidance of actual or imagined uh, trauma reminders. So I'm not going to drive uh, uh, over that reconstructed bridge because that's what collapsed and I had my accident. So I'm going to go with the long way around. That would be one example. Hypervigilance, being overly watchful when there's no longer a need for that. I do um, a session a week for military personnel without charge because I think it's important for me to get back to the world. And uh, so <clears throat> I just have a, uh, a man who's about 35, um, married, got a couple of kids, he loves, he's a good man. Christian, his wife is Christian, and um, uh, was in war in the Middle East and came back and would hibernate in a little shack that he built behind the house with his uh, video monitor so that he spent the entire day watching it and it, it was reflecting back cameras from the two sides of his house and the front of his house so he could see if there were any invaders coming. And he knew, he knew that made no sense, but it's what he needed to do to feel comfortable. Okay? 
So when you encounter people who are doing weird things and they've been through trauma, please don't judge that. Be present, be safe, be consistent, be understanding, be respectfully curious. Now he went through a wonderful program at UCLA which helped him a lot, came back, was starting to slip backwards, that's when he came to see me, and I'm happy to say in a very short period of time we've been able to get him back up, he's now riding his motorcycle again, which he really loves, but he couldn't even get motivated to do that. So, all right, um, hyper startled response. Um, when, when you jump at little things that shouldn't really cause that in the average person. Developing triggers that activate a trauma response. Uh, reordering of self-perception. In other words, uh, people go through trauma and they may then come out later saying, I'm worthless, I'm no good, I'm you know, useless in this world. That would be a reordering of their self-understanding and that's not abnormal in a from a traumatic situation. Uh, who am I that I'm, now that I've lost everything? Look, I've worked so hard for this. Uh, limited window of tolerance, for example, needing to stay away from crowds and noisy places and certain sounds, etc. Disorders of mood, that's like anxiety and depression or uh, thought uh, disorders, borderline um, thinking, Perseveration, that's when you loop about something over and over and over and over again like a broken record. Uh, paranoid thoughts, this, this former soldier talked to me a little bit about the paranoid thinking and so we had to help him work on, work on that and recognizing it's not, this isn't rational but it's understandable. What need am I trying to get met? I'm trying to feel safe. What more rational way can I feel safe that doesn't disconnect me from myself and from others? All of these things that people do that seem crazy, their intent is something that's usually positive. They're trying to get a legitimate need met in a way that's just not very helpful. The same thing can be said of any kind of addiction, be it a substance addiction or what we call a process addiction. Process addictions are things like, um, to, to extreme gambling, um, shopping, pornography use, um, shop, I said shopping already, um, overeating, all of these things, just like drug addictions, and, and can be attempts to get legitimate needs what met in ways that aren't helpful. And that's such a relief when I say that to people, you know? For them to know that, oh, I'm trying to do something that's good, but it's not helpful. Okay. And that I'm not condemning them. Make sense? That's why understanding, 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 understanding. Doesn't mean I excuse, okay? Doesn't mean I understand. And I think that's the, you know, I, I said to somebody recently about church in general, everyone's welcome. Not everything should be celebrated. Because some things are not good for people. But everyone is always welcome because always means always. All of us are broken. And all of us are invited by the grace of God for greater healing. Uh, people can experience dissociation um, that comes in two varieties. <laughs> the personalization, and that's when we don't feel like we're even quite in our body, like we're almost standing outside of ourselves. Uh, derealization when it feels like the world around us isn't quite real. It's a very empty, kind of hollow feeling that people can have either way. When trauma happens, our, our brains are trying to protect themselves. 
And so sometimes we, we experience depersonalization as a way to survive. So you'll hear people, I'm thinking of a colleague of mine that went through a, a sexual assault, and, um, and she said, I remember, I remember the color of the carpet and the drapes. I don't remember the exact assault itself because the narrative this is what happened in this order. It's separated out from the sensory perception. Those are two distinct parts of the brain that normally work together just fine. But during, in the middle of trauma to survive it, people have an experience of, quote, going away. So the sensory part and the narrative part get separated. And over time, they often come back together. So when I'm working with people, I'm not forcing them to tell me all the, the details of what took place in their trauma, because that in and of itself would be traumatic. I could, I could cause them to re-experience the trauma. I don't want to. What I want to do, and we're going to get to this in the notes, is to help them reconnect with what happened while staying present today. It's, the tornado is not happening today, is it? <clears throat> The tornado of a couple of years ago is done. So when we think about those things, we want to make sure that we're really grounded in today. I just need a couple of heads. Is this helpful so far? Because, <laughs> you know, I'm being paid a lot of money to be here. And I want to make sure you get your money. You're at the wrong place. <laughs> well, truth be known, that's I said. I said to Pastor Rick, it's, 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 I am so blessed and so privileged in the work I do. My practice is so thriving that I'm just happy to come and give this this morning. It's a way to say thank you, Jesus. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, inability to experience positive emotions is another sign of trauma. Just a person feels like nothing tastes good, nothing's fun, nothing's enjoyable. That's normal. People will come out of that over time with the right kind of help and also just resilience within. All right. Uh, disturbance in occupational, family, and social function. All trauma is is all trauma is spiritual trauma because you can't separate the psychological from the spiritual. In fact, the, the more we know now about quantum physics, quantum mechanics, string theory, anybody kind of like a geek like me and interested in things like string theory? It, it says that everything is connect, interconnected with everything else. And in the space-time continuum, what appears to be one thing over here and another thing over there, in the, at the quantum level, they're in the same place at the same time. And so when we talk about spirituality, it's about our deepest connection with our most authentic selves, with others, and with the all, God included, then trauma happens and it, it disrupts that sense of connection, even though it's actually there, but we don't sense that because we get our perception is is, is messed with. All right. Somatic symptoms of trauma. Uh, chronic pain, sleep disturbance, chest pain, headaches, digestive distress, uh, disruption of sexual function, low energy. Um, the, the, the body brain connection is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and it will register disconnection with trauma. So we have to be very careful to take very good care of our bodies after a traumatic event in order to take care of our brain, our psyche, our spirit. What are some of the biological elements? All right. So just a little neuropsychology. 
the free prefrontal cortex, it's the front part of your brain. This is the adult, and this is why children have to have parents. And this is why parents need to recognize, well, there are other good reasons. This is when God set things up, right? Pop out of the side of Venus or something. But, but um, the, the prefrontal cortex, the executive part, the thinking part, the rational part, the analytical part of the brain develops until, we used to say 25, guess what? It's up to 30 years of age. Yeah, I know. So yeah, you're, you're legally an adult at 18, but maybe you got a ways to go. So this part of the brain is your sentry and the captain. In other words, it's, it's watching for danger. Developmentally, from an evolutionary biological perspective, this part is the most developed because it wasn't until about 5,000 years ago that we didn't have to step to the edge of the, of the um, cave opening and go, I wonder what might eat me today. <laughs> you know? um, we've not had that long uh, of being at relative peace. Were we constantly having to worry about marauders, invaders, wild critters? seems like we've kind of gone back to that more recently, doesn't it? With the mass shootings and the... And frankly, folks, all of this stuff, you know, we could talk about the stats of crime today. We are in relative peace today if you look at the history of the world. We really are. And yet, what sells? If it bleeds, it bleeds, right? And so what are we bombarded with on the nightly news? And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but uh, sometimes it seems like there's a vested interest in keeping us all edgy and worried. Um, so I watch the news once a day. I watch the nightly news the next morning on Hulu because I ain't going to stay up that late. Uh, <laughs> and I have my breakfast and I go, okay, it's a broad overview of the world and whatever news network you're watching is coming from their perspective. Just remember that, right? That said, there's a lot that makes us, stirs us up and causes us to worry today. Um, this part of the brain is watching for that kind of thing. It's developed to do that. It doesn't have the tendency to celebrate the good as much as it does to watch out for the bad. That's where people of faith need to be reminding themselves of the goodness and the sweetness of life and of God so that we don't get swept up in that. Uh, the neurons that fire together, wire together. If you think in a certain pattern and you're challenged to think in a different way, what do you think these are to do? Oh, yeah, I'll do that instead. Or to stay with what you've been thinking all along. Yes, it's we, 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 the path of least resistance, right? You're asking me to think new thoughts. Uh, mm, but this is so comfortable over here, right? Well, comfortable can, people get comfortable with uncomfortable things that are not healthy for them, but it's what they're used to. So how many times have you heard of somebody who's been married and divorced and turned right around and married the same problem over again in a different person. Because it's what they knew. And they didn't use the rational mind to analyze what was going on. But when people are impacted by a traumatic event, it causes a wiring in the brain that is very strong and has to take it takes time to undo that. And people have to consciously work at that. So a lot of people I work with, I have to help them notice their thought and be able to say, it's just a thought. Just a thought. Does it make it so? It's something I want to kind of perseverate on that is loop on, like a broken record. But I know that doesn't work for me, so I need to detach, come back to my breath. We'll talk about that in just a moment. All right. Um, 
Um, the, the, we have until quarter after, is that right? Yeah, there about. Okay, so um, if this is your brain, this is my public brain, this is the front of your brain up here, okay? This is the brain stem back here, and then the very centers, and this is very simple, but this is the amygdala. The amygdala is your smoke detector and fire alarm. This is the seat of all emotion in your body, okay? And so what happens when a person goes through a traumatic event, their smoke detector and fire alarm becomes too finely um, sensitive. If you light the candles on the dinner table, you don't want the smoke alarm to go off, do you? Right? If, if, you, if it did, you would get a new alarm, but you can't get a new amygdala. So people who have been through traumatic events, they may have an alarm response to something that's too finely sen sensitive, huh? too sensitive. Um, uh, I talked a little bit earlier about when trauma happens, people separate the narrative of what happened versus the sensory experience of it. And that's what I'm talking about here with the almost split brain and dissociative memories. They're meant to protect you, but they can be very frustrating the dissociation can be, because people want to grasp what was it that happened, I need to understand that. But it, usually it takes time for that to come back from the body, the subconscious mind is really ready for it. And then there's the HPA axis. Um, uh, that's the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And when you are in a fight or flight situation, your body pumps out what? Adrenaline, right? Adrenaline is followed by cortisol, which is necessary. But if you're constantly staying in a highly stimulated place, then you're constantly pumping out adrenaline. Your adrenals glands are going to be depleted, which leads to people feeling tired and depressed. The cortisol level is going to stay elevated, which you, you want it elevated at the beginning of the day, and then you want it to drop off, because it's kind of like your morning cup of coffee. But those of us who may have had our adrenals drained crave more coffee all day long, just to keep going. Yeah. Uh, but the problem with that is that the cortisols then lead to inflammation, and inflammation is the root of what? Pain and all disease, oh, yeah. and all disease. So we want to do things to really nurture ourselves, take care of ourselves, uh, to avoid that over that overuse of that HPA axis. So now, here's what you can do to help. Okay, this is what I'm hoping will be helpful for you. When you feel anxious, overwhelmed. I um, want to introduce you to two kinds of breathing. You, but you're going to say to me, but we all breathe and we wouldn't be here any longer. Most of us take very shallow breaths. We don't breathe deeply. And when you're in an anxious situation, you tend to take very shallow breaths. That builds up carbon dioxide in your system, which promotes anxiety. You know what it's like when you feel like you can't get your breath? That's because that carbon dioxide is built up, and it's sending off alarms in the brain. We've got to take a breath. So, two kinds of breathing. One, I call first aid breathing. I got this from Dr. Andrew Huberman at, um, at Stanford University in, in California. And it goes like this. Take a breath, and then you force it out as much as you can, and then you force yourself with one more breath on top of that. So.
Anybody feeling slightly more relaxed now? Um, it takes three to five times, but usually by the time that you're really doing it, you'll feel like you will yawn. You can't yawn and be in a fight or flight uh, place at the same time. So I call that first aid breathing. You're not changing how you think about things. You're just intervening to, to, to break up some of the, the grip of it that anxiety has on you. The other I call mindfulness breathing, and I've got a whole handout on that, but it's very simple. Here's, here's the simple part. I sit quietly twice a day for three to five minutes to start. And frankly, if you do it twice a day, every day, five minutes, max even, it's great. What does it look like? I'm just sitting in a relaxed place or reclining slightly. I don't want people going to sleep. And I set my timer for three to five minutes. And all I'm focusing on is my breath. I'm practicing being, not doing. And I see enough faces around here to know, because I'm 66 myself. So, you know, I was raised to be a doer, right? You get rewarded for doing, you don't get rewarded for being. And yet, we're human beings. And so, what the mindfulness breathing does, well first I'll describe it and then we'll talk about what it does. I'm sitting quietly and I'm focusing on my breath, in through my nose, until I'm comfortably full, not like we just did, just comfortably full. And then I'm breathing out through my mouth slowly. And all I'm doing is breathing. I'm focusing on experiencing, and I'm not analyzing my breath. I'm not thinking about the breath. I'm just breathing. And I'm doing pretty well for two breaths, and then I think I should go by the dry cleaner when I get home today. I need to look at the <laughs> now, I can say, doggone it, I failed. And I have to start <laughs> over again. Push the damn phone and <laughs> set the timer. No. As soon as I recognize that I'm thinking, I simply detach from the thought and return to my breath. I don't try to push it out. I don't judge it. I just go, oh. And I come back to my breath. And a couple more breaths later, I think, and I should return Rick's call. And, then, oh. <laughs> and then I detach from that thought and I come back to my breath. And I do it over and over and over again. This is a really important spiritual practice. And you say, but it's not talking about Jesus. No, but it might make you more available to Jesus. If you can have a neurology that's calm and centered. And here's the bonus. It allows you then to have the capacity over time, because what will happen if you do this consistently, you're going to realize, gee, I went through that entire three to five minutes, and I really only had a couple of thoughts. Otherwise, I stayed with my breath. So it's, it's enabling you to notice something and quickly detach. If I have a tendency to worry about things and I do this mindfulness breathing, I'm going to be better able to go, oh, that's one of my crazy thoughts, and detach and come back to my breath and soothe myself. Okay? Soothe myself. Every adult man has a little boy inside. Every adult woman has a little girl inside. The parents aren't left to do the nurturing and the caregiving anymore. But the adult in the person is able to care for the child. Does that make sense? So we're the ones that can soothe the anxious child within. Mindfulness breathing. Every, I even have a prescription pad. I don't write for pharmaceuticals, but I have a behavioral prescription pad. And I put things on that pad. And I sign my name, and I put the patient's name on the top, and I give it to them. Because the research has shown if you put it on a prescription pad, people are more likely to do it. <laughs> give them a regular hand. So I have a prescription pad. Here's your prescription. 
That's one lady I said, do you take probiotics? And she said, I'm supposed to. My functional medicine doctor says I should. My children get them every day. And I said, that's great. Here's a prescription. Follow your physician's orders with regard to your probiotics. I gave it to her. Next week, I said, how are you doing? She said, I put that on my refrigerator door, and I follow it every day. I said, okay, great. Um, do this. If you want me to write it on my prescription pad, I will. <laughs> but do the mindfulness breathing. And when you are overwhelmed, do the first aid breathing. Make sense so far? Because you can't stay in a fight or flight, freeze or fawn response and be relaxed at the same time. When I came to town, part of why I moved to Nashville was to take, make sure that two elderly parents who would run out of money before they ran out of life in California would have a good place to be taken care of. So they were in an assisted living place, substitute, uh, substituted, um, subsidized by the Roman Catholic Diocese. Uh, they took all comers, um, and um, so I, I brought them here. I started a practice. I was working part-time for the church downtown. There were sometimes, most weeks, there were at least one medical appointment for one of the two of them, and there were some weeks where I had three medical appointments for the two of them in one week's time as I was trying to make a private practice work and trying to hold down a quarter-time position at, at a Lutheran church downtown. Do you think I sometimes felt overwhelmed? Do you think I sometimes woke up at 2 in the morning having crazy, paranoid thoughts that, oh my God, what if I say something wrong and somebody charges me with something and I lose my license and my livelihood? You've never had any of those kind of thoughts. Have you? <laughs> and I practiced what I preach, folks, and did the mindfulness breathing and would go back to sleep. But you got to practice it. Don't wait till you need it. Practice ahead of time. All right. All right. Um, gratitude. Research has shown, clinical research has shown, how phenomenal gratitude is for you. Some people, they get up and every day, they write down something they're grateful for, or they'll write down as many things as they can. I don't do that, but I do naturally, because I've gotten practiced at it, just notice what's good and true and beautiful. Those are the three Greek virtues, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And notice those throughout my day, wherever I'm going. Somebody came in, one of the kids came in doing something that was just biggest sweet kid. His service started. I just kind of noticed and thought, what beauty there is in this world. Yeah. The kindness of neighbors. You know, the littlest things. I love coffee. Blessed elixir, coffee is mine. I love the beans when they're ground so fine. Smell the aroma wafting on high. Coffee is brewing, soon will pour not. This is my coffee, this is my cup. Go to the brim and drink it all up. This is my coffee, this is my cup. Go to the brim and drink it all up. I made up that song when I had a teetotaling pastor. Uh, as my vicarage supervisor, um, and if we didn't sing Best Blessed Assurance on Sunday, we had to sing it in midweek service. I got so doggone tired of that. But I had listened to Garrison Keeler, and Garrison Keeler made up new lyrics to old hymns, and so that's how I survived vicarage. I would sing that song. And sing. Anyway, I still love coffee, and I come down in the morning, and I'm making coffee, and I go, thank you, God. <laughs> And I don't mean that in a flip way. I really mean I'm thanking God for the gift of coffee. I love it. But I only drink it in the morning because coffee is a half-life of five or six hours. So if you drink it in the middle of the day, you still may be experiencing the effects of caffeine at 9 o'clock at night. So have your coffee in the morning and be done with it. All right. Um, okay, gratitude, nutrition is very important. I did a year-long fellowship two years ago in integrative psychiatry, and uh, the importance of nutrition, nutritional supplementation, gut health. If your gut's not happy, your brain's not going to be happy. Where do you think most of the neurochemicals that your brain release are made? In the gut. No junk food, no processed food. 
no bad oils, olive oil, virgin, extra virgin olive oil that really is, because that's a, a lot of olive oil scams out there, um, avocado oil, um, pardon me? Great. Mm, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do great. Well, some people cook with it. But yeah, you have to be careful of the bad oils. Anyway, uh, exercise. Um, exercise re can release dopamine, serotonin. Um, so moving. If I can get people moving. If I can get them eating right and moving, and breathing, I can help bring them out of anxiety and depression. Just those two things alone. No psychiatric medications required. There is a time and a place for psych meds. I'm not against them altogether. They're overprescribed. I just say that much. Um, limiting alcohol and caffeine. Uh, alcohol, of course, is a, a central nervous system depressant, and, and caffeine and jacks us up. Uh, adrenal rehabilitation. We talked about the HPA axis getting drained, so uh, sleep is important. Um, th there are some adaptogens that can be taken to help with adrenal fatigue. Uh, ashwagandha would be one of them. Uh, some of you may have heard of. Uh, holy basil, which is not actually basil. It's a different herb altogether, but one of my psychiatrist friends who went through the same program with me prescribes that regularly. Um, I had a couple of gentlemen that came to see me and they were taking Ambien. Ambien's kind of fun. It can cause you weird, weird nightmares. I mean, I heard of one um, therapist who was staying in a hotel and she woke up in the morning. She was at a conference. She was staying in a hotel and she woke up in the morning and there were all these candy bar wrappers all over the bed. Where did these come from? In the middle of the night while she was on, uh, it was either Lunesta or one, one of those ambient, she, she, she got up in the middle of the night and went to the snack machine and cleaned it out. <laughs> now, I had a couple guys that came to see me and they said, it's not working for me. I said, well, I'm going to make a suggestion that you take back to your physician and you ask your doctor if you can do this, because I don't prescribe, but I can educate. And I said, I'm going to suggest 2,000 milligrams of magnesium L3, and the magnesium comes in various forms. So I suggest magnesium L3 and 2,000 milligrams, and L-theanine. L-theanine is the component of green tea that's calming. Because green tea can help you be alert, but can also calm. It's the calming part. It has no caffeine. 200 milligrams of L-theanine. Put those together about an hour before bed. Both came back the next week and said, it's a miracle drug. I said, no, it's not. It's not. It's a, it's a mineral, magnesium. And L-theanine is a, a um, L amino acid. That's all it is, building block protein. Doctor approved. Sometimes people, I, I say that to cover myself because of the lawyers, right? People do whatever they want to do. And, and the, you know, there are some, not everything that's natural is safe. Please remember that. So if you're going to add in anything new, do check with, make sure, check with a qualified medical person because you don't want to potentiate a medication you're already on, which means it makes it stronger. Okay. You don't want to do that. All right. Uh, grounding. Five things, five senses. This is, I learned this from a, a vet. Uh, recently, I hadn't, it's a, it's a great idea. Grounding means we locate ourselves in the place where we are. Like, I'm in this place. If I was having a little anxiety about being here, I'd say, Brian, you're in a very safe place. Rick is a good man. He wouldn't invite you into a dangerous place. These are good people here. The room is solid around you. There's no, there's no tornadoes that are in sight. You're safe. Take a breath, Ryan. You're safe. It's okay. The floor underneath you is solid. You're okay. That's ground. Okay. Reminding ourselves. But here's another way to ground. I love this. We have five senses, right? 
if I'm feeling agitated, what are five things that I can see and name around me? Organ, chair, altar, pulpit, piano. What are five things that I can see? What are four things that I can hear? I can hear the sound of my own voice. I can hear the air conditioning running. I can hear the buzz of the lights. I can hear kids outside. I can hear maybe traffic going. What are three things that, um, that I could smell? You know, well, maybe I could smell the oranges over there. What are two things that I could could taste? So what do we got? Sight, taste, smell, touch, hearing. hearing. So take them in any order you want, doesn't matter. But it's a way to get a person out of looping, right? It's a way to get them out of focusing what's on what the the scary stuff. All right. Um, establishing routine. Why? Because routines indicate some control. And getting into routine and predictability. One of the things that PT, folks with PTSD do not want is unpredictability. No surprises. Do a, do a favor for people who have PTSD, don't surprise them. Because did that trauma come as a surprise? Sure did. So it could trigger a trauma response. Hey, I'd love to celebrate your birthday. I won't be jumping out of a cake. <laughs> I'd like to take you to lunch or something like that. All right. Um, sleep. Get plenty of sleep, folks. You know we need seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Guided imagery. Um, I do a lot of guided imagery and hypnosis with people, but I'll tell you the dirty little secret of hypnotists, and that is that all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. I don't hypnotize you. I simply guide you in hypnotizing yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And finally, prayer. And that's not to say that that's the last thing. It's just the last thing on my list. What is prayer but conversation with God about speaking and listening? And, um, and, and prayer can be a utmost benefit. So the final thing I have is this quote. Um, you cannot undo the traumatic event, but you can change your relationship with it. And that's what we're saying, seeking to do. All right, that's it. Any any questions before class is dismissed? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you talked, you talked about magnesium. It was like magnesium. L-threonate. T-H-R-E-O-N-A-T-E. -E. Use it one more time. T H R E O N A T E. Okay. Yeah. Right. Some mag some magnesiums are what we get are in like milk of magnesia, and that's the kind right. of course that gets us going. Uh, but this this it actually gets through the blood brain barrier, and that's why it's effective and relaxing. Magnesium is a muscle relaxant, and uh, so that's part of why it contributes to sleep. Yeah. Anything else? All right, well, you've got my information there. If I can be of any help to you folks, feel free to reach out to me, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. This would not have happened without you. So. Thank you for listening to us. <laughs> I did it once, so maybe I'll do it again. <laughs> Set a precedent here. And I'll stay around for a couple minutes if people want to come okay. and talk. Thank you, Gary. I guess you close everything up. And that kind of thing. Some people have kids they have to rescue. A copy of what you passed out.